this was all circulating around the base that a giant had been killed, but no one was supposed to talk about it. I saw three long bony fingers reach up underneath the door, curl up to grab it, and then disappear. When he came over to me, dude, he slithered over to me. And this giant comes out of the cave and they're all frozen. And he starts running and firing at this giant. Well, the giant moves. He's got a spear in one hand and he's running really fast and spears Dan and holds him up like this. Somebody yells, shoot him in the face, shoot him in the face. They basically decapitate him. Got closer, got closer, got closer. When he got about 15 yards away from me, I raised that 12 gauge and I blow his head off. I feel something pulling at my leg. And I look over and there are two small gray entities pulling at me. And they're literally, I'm getting pulled off the bed. I reached my hand into this bush and I touched air. Couldn't breathe and I couldn't move because I know I'm seeing a monster. Yep. Welcome to the show, everybody. You're listening to The Confessionals. I am your host, Tony Merkel. Thank you for being here. If you've had an encounter or a story you'd like to share with me on the show, go ahead and shoot me an email. My email address is theconfessionals at theconfessionalspodcast.com. That's theconfessionals at theconfessionalspodcast.com. Or go to the website, theconfessionalspodcast.com, hit the contact section, and you can reach me that way as well. Either way works for me. Just get a hold of me. And if you want more shows every week, on Thursdays, we release a bonus show to members only on the website. So if you want to get access to that show, all previous shows and all future shows, just go to theconfessionalspodcast.com, hit the join button, and become a member today. And if you want some emergency preparedness food, go to preparewiththeconfessionals.com. That's preparewiththeconfessionals.com because you never know when you're going to need some extra food in the house, in your cars, or when you're out hiking looking for Bigfoot and you get lost. You might want some of that extra food, and we have it there at preparewiththeconfessionals.com. And if you order the four-week supply of food, we'll knock $100 off for you. Now, this week we have two interviews coming up for you. We have Mark and Josh. We're going to start off with Mark when he talks about a lot of different possession, demonic kind of stuff, including a time when his sister-in-law, his ex-sister-in-law was possessed and he saw her head spinning in a way that only sounds like it belongs in a movie. Let's get to Mark right now. All right, today we got a great guest coming on the show. We have Mark. Mark, how you doing, man? I'm good, man. How are you? I'm doing good, doing good. So uh, you have an interesting story that uh, you went through with some family and your your sister in law. Uh, there was a possession, and I I think that this is going to be a fun story for people to hear, uh, and also the reality of the situation and how this can affect people and their family members uh, when people go through this. But uh, if you could just kind of walk us into this experience where uh, your sister-in-law started having some crazy stuff happen in her home. And uh, well, then you guys found out there was something else going on too. Sure. Yeah. So um, it was about 2010 to 2012, somewhere in that area. I can't quite remember. Um, But my brother had been um on his he had just left for his first tour in afghanistan uh, in the marine corps and so my sister-in-law was staying in jacksonville at the time uh, with their young daughter i think she was around two um and she started experiencing some just weird stuff you know stuff you kind of shrug off um things like she would see lights flickering or you know sounds or you know bumps or things and it was just kind of one of those things that was like you know it's a a house we just bought we're not really sure we're still learning the house and sometimes houses make noises when they're settling and things like that and weather changes so she didn't think too much about it um but one time specifically she remembered that 
um, she was in the kitchen and um, her daughter was playing on the floor and it was like this light came into the room and hit the floor and it was like a prism like a almost like you know a refraction light and it came in and had all these colors on it and it was dancing on the floor and she kind of thought that it was something that she had seen and like it was you know uh, did i see that did i not see that and she just kind of looked over at it kind of caught her eye and she like looked over and she saw that my or my niece had had seen it as well so she knew she wasn't crazy and it just kind of went all the way up the wall and onto the ceiling and she was like that's not normal and this is broad daylight you know she has nothing in her windows that are that would send out that refraction light prism light and it just is sitting on the ceiling and she's just like looking at it and um all of a sudden it just goes away well, that kind of started the really serious stuff. And a few days later, she's kind of in the kitchen again, and she's doing her thing. And she hadn't been cooking or anything. It was, you know, probably lunchtime, but she probably had made something in the microwave for my niece or whatever the case may be, but she hadn't used the stove. And none of the lights were on the stove. And she went to go get a pan out i guess to put something uh like start making cookies or something she reaches in the oven and grabs the pan and it is scorching hot like the oven had been on like 475 and i mean it i mean i saw her hand it was burnt and i was like she's telling me this story i was just kind of like sitting back and i'm like this is getting creepy well then it got even worse so she's just kind of getting ready for bed. She put my niece down and out of the corner of her eye, she sees something and she's watching TV and it's along the room, the wall in the living room. And she sees it again. And then again, a third time, finally, she's like, what am I seeing? And she looks over there, looks her eyes from the TV to the living room wall. And she sees this black shadow start from the corner and run down the wall. And she just absolutely lost it. And she got really super scared. She went in there and checked on her daughter. Daughter was fine. One, you know, it was kind of one of those things, you know, you just kind of, you, I'm in this situation. I've got to live here. So she just kind of shrugged it off and, you know, went to bed or whatever, just scared, but went to bed. And um, maybe like a night or two after that, she started seeing them in her bedroom and sitting on the corners or like crouched down in the corner and it scared her so bad. And then the last straw was she woke up in the middle of the night and I don't know what night it was in time frame, but she woke up in the middle of the night and she's nose to nose to one of these things. And it's just staring at her, Jeez. just looking in her eyes. And she was I mean, that was it. So she, in the middle of the night, scooped up my niece. They packed their stuff in a car, and she comes to live with my parents. Well, a few days go by, and everything's cool. Nothing's happening. Um, but then, like, and I don't know, because I wasn't there. I wasn't living there at the time. I had lived there for a little bit, but I hadn't lived there. I'm, I was hearing all this kind of secondhand, so they couldn't remember what day it was or what time or whatever. But she would start seeing these things at their house where she was, at, you know, at my parents' house. And um, they would be in the bathroom, in the kitchen, or in her room, and it just, it just got out of hand. Well all these stories that she had told us, they, I had just happened to be over there one night. And, um, so she's sitting on the couch and she's telling me these stories and this is kind of where it all comes to a head. And she's at, she's asking me, she's like, I don't know what to do. She knew I'd been in ministry for years and had experienced some darker stuff, but, um, she was trying to get to the bottom of it. She's like, I can't live like this anymore. She's like, I can't sleep. I can't, Eat. I can't do anything and enjoy life. And um, so I had 
just sat down with her and I was like trying to make her feel better. And I said, you know, there are dark things in this world that we don't necessarily see all the time and they're at war with the good. And um, I knew she, you know, had grown up kind of in a rough life and um, didn't necessarily, I mean, knew of God, obviously, but wasn't, uh, I wouldn't call her a, a believer. And um, so I was like trying to explain to her, like, you know, demons and angels aren't just beautiful or things that, you know, angels aren't beautiful things we read about in a book and, and they're, they're real. And the same thing with demons, if there's a, a good side, there has to be a dark side and um, because evil exists. And so I was telling her, like, they, I believe that what's, what you're experiencing is demonic. And she was like, do you think I'm possessed? And I said, I, you know, I, I don't. I can't say yay or nay from the situation that you, you've, or the stories that you've explained to me or told me. So I, I want to just, you know, just fill it out and see what's going on. Well, as I'm sitting here talking to her about God and the Bible and, you know, how, you know, just, just speaking to her spiritually, I look at her and she's not looking at me. She's looking at the ground. And I notice her hands are together, um, almost like you're holding hands with somebody, but like they're clenched together. And I look at her knuckles, and her knuckles are white. And she is squeezing her hands together like she has a death grip on herself. And I, I call her name out. I don't want to give her name out, but I call her name out. And I, I said, are you okay? Not didn't look up, didn't do any of that. She just goes, yes, just like that. And I said, I don't think you're okay. And she went, no, just like that. And I said, okay. So I walk over to her and I say her name again. And I said, I'm going to try something. Is that okay? And she went, yes. And this deep voice, I mean, it wasn't, it was her voice, but it was deep and it was angry. And my brother-in-law is standing in the room with me. And I said, and at this time, my parents were there too, with my niece. And I looked at my stepmom and I said, you need to take my niece and you guys need to go upstairs because it's about to get real. And um, so she didn't blink an eye. She was scared out of her mind. So she scoops up my niece and they march upstairs and I look at my brother-in-law and my brother-in-law, we both have been heavily involved in the church and been in ministry together. And I'm, but he was kind of not, I don't know. He was open to that kind of stuff and knew that stuff happened, but he was just kind of like, he'd never seen it before. And I looked at him and his eyes are like golf balls. And I was like, it's about to get real. I said, you know, I, I need you. I need to know if you're ready for this or you need to go too. And he was like, I, I want to stay. I want to stay. And I said, okay, here we go. So I go back and I say, I'm going to try something. I don't know what's going to happen. I reach over, I say a prayer and I reach over and I just touch her forehead and her in that, I mean, the exact moment my fingertips hit her forehead, she throws her head back and she's like, don't touch me. It burns. It burns. Don't touch me. And she just kept screaming that over and over and over again. And her head was tilted so far back. It looked like the, the back of her head was almost touching in between her shoulder blades. And, and she throws her head back forward and she just starts just spinning her head and like not all the way around, not like the exorcist and, and Linda Blair. It wasn't like that. It was like in a circular motion and you, it just, it didn't look real. It looked like something off a movie, but it wasn't like her neck was breaking or anything like that, but it was just that circle. And it was, it didn't look it didn't look inhuman, but it was, it was definitely physical. And, and I looked at my brother-in-law and he's just absolutely terrified. And I wanted to run out of the house. He wanted to run out of the house. And 
I think at that moment we knew we we were in in deep and and I, I told him I said dude we have to pray over this house right now and I look at her and she had gone back into that position where she had her hands clenched together and her head down and I said I think she's okay for them for the moment let's let's go and, and start praying over the house just so we have some protection here and we're not you know we're, we're not fighting on the devil's battleground right here we we need a hedge of protection over the house and over us so we start praying together we're walking around the house and i have never felt this before but the way the living room was set up the bedroom that she was staying in was kind of to the left of her off the couch so it was like a living room then a bedroom i the door was open in the bedroom and, I, and the lights were off and I was praying over the house and I just, something told me like, go in there. I walked through the threshold of the bedroom and I'm not, I'm not kidding you, Tony. It was like walking through saran wrap. It just stretched my face back. It just stretched across. It felt like when you're walking through the woods and you just run through spider webs and it just stretched across me and I felt like I had it on me and I'm like wiping, like wiping my face. And I don't know, it was the weirdest feeling I've ever had in my life. And I know there was nothing there, but it, it just felt like I was crossing over into the darkness and it was so thick in the air. You could feel it on your skin. And, um, I, I've never experienced anything like that. So I'm praying in there and I'm like, get out of this house. You don't belong here in the name of Yeshua. Get out of this house. In the name of Jesus, get out. And um, so I'm walking through and I look and something catches my eye to the right. And there was a bathroom that kind of extended to the back of the house off of that bedroom. And I look over and this thing, this dark shadow person entity was in a Spider-Man position on the floor staring at me through that down that hallway and the lights were off but i could just it was so dark it was darker than the dark in the room and it was just sitting there looking at me like it was gonna jump on me and i don't know <laughs> it, i have never experienced i've never experienced that kind of darkness but i've also never experienced that kind of courage and I think that I was, it was it, looking back on, I was like, dang, that was stupid. Why did I do that? But then at the same time, I was just felt so empowered by trying to help this girl. But also like, I felt empowered by, by the spirit, spiritual nature of God and, and the power that he, he um, possesses. And it was like, he was where we were fighting a possession. I felt possessed by the spirit in a good way to go and just tackle this thing. So I start, I get this courage up and I just take this deep breath and I start walking towards it. And I would like to say that I, I looked like the Terminator or something, you know, walking towards this thing and I was about to take it out. But I know, I know I probably looked a lot more scared than that, but I was just like, my chest was puffed out and I was walking towards it and I'm just praying. I'm like, get out, get out, get out In the name of Jesus, get out. And like, that moment, that thing comes by me like a like I was at a NASCAR race and I was sitting front row and it comes by me and like I feel the wind off of it and it runs by me and then I turn around as as it ran by me I turned and looked and it goes out the door out the the bedroom door and I was like yes I think we got that out of here and. I walk into my brother-in-law. I was like, did you see that? And he was like, yes, I saw it. And uh, he's like, he's like, it's gone, man. I think it's gone. And I looked at my sister-in-law and I was like, I think it's gone now. And not without looking up, her hands are still clenched. She says, no, it's not. And I was like, oh. I was like, then where is it? And she, she said, it's down the hallway. And so I go down there. And I'm like praying, I'm praying. I don't feel anything. I'm like, this doesn't feel anything like the bedroom. I'm like, there's nothing down here. And she was like, it's still here. Not looking up, hands still clenched together. 
I look at my brother, uh, my brother-in-law and I'm like, dude, it is here. It's in her. And I was like, she's messing with us. I was like, I know it's not her, but this thing is messing with us. It's sending us, getting us away from her. And he was like, oh, dude, we got to pray for her. And I was like, yeah, we got to pray. And so I said, on the count of three, let's both put our hands on her. We'll start praying for her. Now, understand, like, I've never done this before. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just trying to let God guide me because I've never, ever, ever exercised anybody before or since. So I had no idea other than this one instance. So we both put our hands on her. And as soon as we do, she starts fighting us. I mean, not not fist fighting, but just we we've got a hold of her and she's throwing us around like rag dolls. I mean, we finally wrestle her sort of to the ground, but she's like in a push up position. And at the time, I probably weighed 140. My brother law weighs 165. So we're not tiny dudes, but, you know, we're not huge either. But she's like five one and 110 pounds of soaking wet you know what i mean and she's in this push-up position and she is just lifting us off the ground over and over and over again we're laying on top of her i've got my knee in her back i've got my hand wrapped around her forehead just praying as hard as i can pray my brother-in-law's trying to hold her down and she's just push doing push-ups she finally throws us off like like bane or something she just like throws us and I hit the back of or the front of the sofa with my back and my brother-in-law is standing there and he's like, we got to pray. We got to pray. And she's just doing the head thing again. She's swinging her head around like in a circular motion and she's going, don't touch me. Don't touch me. Don't touch me. And, um, so I like freak out. And then I, I, I put my hand back on her, on her forehead and her hand, her, my hand is like not staying on her forehead. Cause she's doing all this circular motion stuff. And she's just like, don't touch me. Don't touch me. Get away from me. This, it burns. And I mean, she just kept saying that stuff over and over and over again. We did this for like 45 minutes and there would be breaks. Well, actually I, I can only remember like one break in all of it. And it was like, we just took a breath and it was like, I think it's gone. And it's like, as soon as we said it, it would start back up again. And she just kept doing that over and over again. Her eyes were rolled back in her head. I mean, it was just the craziest. Like, I don't even remember all the details. There's probably a lot more stuff that happened. I just don't remember it because it was like a whirlwind. When we got done, it was like 45 minutes later. She was just peaceful and quiet and it just stopped. And... I sat back and sat in the chair and I was just exhausted and my brother-in-law was exhausted. And, um, I was like, I think it's gone. I think it's gone. And she was sitting there on the couch. And now at this point, she's like looking at us and it looks like her. It doesn't look, you know, it was just a, she didn't look angry or didn't, it, it was her. And she says, I think it's gone too. She's like, I don't feel the heaviness. And I, like I said, I never, you know, you hear in the, uh, maybe in some stories, like they throw up or, you know, they, something comes out of them. And it wasn't like that. It was just stop. It was like peace. And um, she was like, I, I just, I don't feel it anymore. And I was like, I don't either. There and my brother-in-law agreed with us and she said I can tell you something Mark when you walked in the room tonight and I started telling you those stories she said this thing kept telling me to hate you and kill you and I was like oh, my goodness so I knew in that exact moment that she was possessed and this thing was controlling her I knew I mean I kind of thought that before but this was, this was a true possession. And I realized in that moment too, like we exercised her. We did that, you know, with the help of God. I mean, we, we, we conquered that thing, man. And, um, man, I just, it, I, to this day, it is one of the scariest and 
gut wrenching things I've ever experienced in my entire life. And, um, yeah, I mean, I, I can definitely see why it would be gut wrenching and terrifying, uh, even to the, the idea of what you described as it felt like you were walking into a spider's web. That that's something that's often described, uh, when it comes to this kind of stuff, like, like there's, I don't know if it's like you're walking into an entity itself or if you're walking into just a, a space that's just, you know, completely drenched in, uh, heavy spiritual, um, I don't even want to say warfare, just, just a presence, you know? Um, mm -hmm. but that's something that, that is often described by people. And, uh, some people believe it's, you know, like a guardian angel or a spirit guide, but in your situation, I wouldn't say it was a spirit <laughs> guide. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and, and the thing is, is, is that it almost, it was almost like the the room was like filled with jello and you just walked into it. You know what I mean? It was just, it felt all around you. And I knew that, you know, it was, it was darkness. It was something spiritual and it didn't want me there. And, um, you know, and you, and, you know, I think we see that stuff on TV and we think, Oh yeah, it's just, you know, the, the paranormal ghost hunters, ghost adventures, those guys and stuff. I think that they, you know, they talk about their emotion. Oh, I feel sad. I feel like I could cry. I feel like all that, you know, I, I, I part of me is like, Oh, that's just show. But experiencing that it was like emotional, like it almost made me sick. It was like, I, I want to cry. I want to laugh. I want to, you know what I mean? It was like all of that mixed together. And it was like, that's what I mean. My gut wrenching. It was like my stomach was turning and it, it was actually like, I don't know. It felt like somebody had a hold of my intestines and we're just squeezing and um, it was very painful, but, um, but yeah, so, so can I, can I elaborate and go a little further, like a day later? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, so, so right after this, right. So I'm, I'm like on this spiritual high now. So like I, I'm working uh, late night, uh, armed security, I'm cruising through apartment complex and I'm just like praising God. I'm like, singing worship music and I got the windows rolled down and it's like 3 a.m. It's like 2 33 a.m. Cruising through and this apartment complex I had patrolled many, many, many times. So I knew, knew it like the back of my hand. And, um, and I, I just come down this hill and there's like a dumpster at the bottom of the hill. I come down this hill and, um, I'm singing my praise and worship music and, I, I, something catches my eye and I look over to the right on the passenger side of the car and there's a lady standing by the dumpster and I'm like, wait a minute, what time is it? It's three, almost three o'clock in the morning. Why is this lady out here at night? I pull up and she was so close to the car, Tony, like I looked, I had to lean forward and look out the passenger window and up to see her face. And I noticed she was holding something in her hands. She's wearing a weird nighty, I guess you would call it like a nightgown, but it wasn't full length. It came to like the top of her knees and it had frilly like lace on the bottom and the sleeves of it were puffy. And it was like, and her hair was, I don't, I don't want to be like, mean but like it was kind of like you know the old lady cut it was like you know short but curly like she had like a perm yeah and then she had like a bonnet on her head and it had lace around it and she's holding waist high facing me a brown teddy bear and when i got down the hill i was like oh maybe it's a little girl or is she lost is she whatever so I get down and I cruise up and I look out the passenger window, leaning forward. I look up at her face and she looked, I'm getting hair. My hair is standing up on my arms and my neck. She looked like an old lady, but with young skin. I know that sounds weird, but I, it's hard to, to, to describe. There was just this thing. My first thought was, Oh, it's an old lady. And then I was like, double take. No, that's not an old lady. That's like a, a young, 
almost like she had down syndrome just a little bit like just those kind of features and at that moment when we locked eyes i noticed that that wasn't a person i mean she didn't have like black eyes or anything like that i just it didn't look human and she smiled and if any of you have seen alice in wonderland that chest oh god i can't talk <clears throat> give me a second hold on just a second <laughs> Cheshire cat. <laughs> <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. Take your time. Yeah, um, Cheshire cat from Alice in Wonderland. And the way she smiled, it just touched ear to ear. And I'm telling you, man, I have never, ever 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 experienced that in my entire life and it scared me to death and at that moment i had my foot on the brake but i was rolling because i was on a hill so i was rolling just a little bit <clears throat> and i rolled i just kept rolling as i was looking at her so the car she was at, you know the car was moving so she was just kind of going down the side of the car and she didn't move I kept my eye on her. I watched her in my side view mirror. Once I passed her and went up the hill, I saw her in my rear view and she was still standing there. And so I whipped the car real quick. There was a parking lot, a parking spot right beside me. So I whipped the car in. I hop out. I, I, when I tell you I was so scared, I was so scared. I pulled my flashlight out and, I, and the next thing I pulled out was my firearm, my sidearm. And I'm doing like a, a real slow tactical walk towards the, the dumpster because I'm like, I don't know what this thing is. I don't know if it's human. I don't know what it is. And so I'm, I'm walking towards the dumpster and I don't see her there. And the nearest apartment was probably, uh, I would say a good 50 yards, 200 feet some some kind of it was a it was a long ways let's just say it was a long ways and anybody that wasn't wearing shoes or anything like that could not have run to hide in the amount of time it took me to park the car it was a, it was a good distance it would have taken a, an nfl player not not a person with no shoes on and so i'm like looking all through the apartment buildings and i've got my gun out and i see nothing just gone without a trace and i get back in my car and the first person i call is my pastor i mean i i immediately got on the phone with my pastor and i was like dude i know it's three o'clock in the morning i know you're asleep you won't believe what i just saw i was like you need to pray with me pray for me and um so we prayed right there i call another buddy of mine who was um, working in ministry with me at the time and we prayed together and as I was telling my pastor what I saw, like he he told me the same thing. He said, "My hairs are standing up." Uh, he's like, I, "I have never heard anything like that." And I was like, "Neither have I. Neither have I ever seen anything like that." And I was like, it, "It's I'm really freaked out." And uh, dude, I'm telling you, I think that thing was messing. I mean, I know it was messing with me. I know because I was such on a, a god high after helping my sister-in-law out. It was just place there to scare me <clears throat> and um it, I, it still bothers me today like even talking about it like me telling you about it it like makes my chest tight that's why i'm like having trouble talking to you because it, it causes i don't know i don't know if it's it's just it just tries to attack me every now and then i, I don't know it's not that lady or anything it's just when i start getting I start doing good for people like this thing just it's it's like it's still pissed off at me <laughs> you know from helping my sister out our sister-in-law I, I i don't know what to to make of it but um, um when, before we did this interview and i was just like getting everything ready and set up and my chest just got tight and that's why i kind of sound like i'm short of breath a little bit because it was like 
I, I just had this feeling like this thing is pissed. It doesn't want you to tell the story. And um, I don't know. I don't know if that's true or not. I don't know if that's just my imagination, but uh, that's the way I feel about it. <clears throat> when you went through this thing with your sister-in-law and you mentioned about your brother-in-law being there, uh, right? That was your brother-in-law that was there? Yes. Yes. Correct. Was that one of her relatives, like her brother or something? No, it was actually um, my my biological sister. It was her husband. I got you. Okay. And yeah. when when that whole thing happened, and you touched her the first time, and she's like, "It burns." It, she, you said that her head started turning. Yeah, it was like rolling in a rolling motion, like, but not like you know, like spinning on her shoulders. Right, not like a Linda Blair exorcism thing where her head spun all the way around. It was just, it, she threw her head back and then she would roll. So like her chin was like touching her chest and then roll back. But it was, I, I don't think, it was. It didn't look human. I mean, it looked inhuman, the way, the movement and stuff. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, things like that happen a lot with people that are truly possessed by demons. Uh, I was just talking to somebody last week and I forget where I was, it's one of the problems with being who I am is I talk to so many people. I can't remember <laughs> if it was an interview or if it was real life or what, but I was talking to somebody and they were talking about um, an experience they had with somebody who was demonically possessed and that their face literally like contorted. Like it was, it was mm. just there. Like you can't move your face. You know what I mean? <laughs> but this, right, right. the person's face was literally like, contorting and, and changing the way it actually physically looked uh, right there in real time. And it, it's like, when you hear that kind of stuff, it, it really makes you wonder and, and question what reality is, because we, we feel like, you know, okay, well, we're human beings, our, our bodies can't move a certain way, yet you hear these instances where people are possessed by a demonic spirit, and their body does things it's not supposed to do. And it's, it's theoretically at least because they're possessed by a demonic entity. So it makes you wonder if this body that we live in is far more spiritual than what we give it credit for. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. I believe that 110%. Yeah. I mean, I, cause you know, like you, you hear, you know, people teach it. Well, maybe not everybody hears this, but I, I've heard it <laughs> where you're like, you know, part body, part soul, part spirit. And mm -hmm. it just makes you wonder is it really, is it, is it like 33% on each one <laughs> or, is yeah, it, right, right. or is like the, the, the body like 15% because when you hear things like this, it, it seems impossible unless you consider the fact that, you know, maybe our bodies literally aren't as physical as we, we think they are. Right. And, you know, you know, it's crazy too, because uh, you saying that, uh, you know, you ever had that feeling that you, you meet somebody for the first time and you're like, I don't like this guy. And they've given you, I mean, you've literally met that person for like 10 seconds, but there is just, I, that's what I, I kind of feel like you're saying is like, we have that spiritual body in us and we're like, Hey, like, you don't like this guy cause he's bad news. And you know, I would call that intuition or whatever. I feel like that is the spirit inside of us saying, look, you know, stay away from this guy or this girl or whatever. Um, but, uh, that's the way I feel about it. Um, but you know, it was funny cause, uh, about, uh, about a year ago, two years ago, um, I got a message from my sister-in-law on Facebook and she said, all it said was it's back and I haven't heard from her since. How long ago was that? It was about a year ago year and a half maybe and you haven't heard from your sister-in-law since well she's at my ex sister-in-law oh yeah that's right that's right yeah so I, I haven't i mean i haven't i see her daughter and i mean obviously i know she's alive but i just haven't i sent her a message back and i was like we need to pray and stuff like that and she just said it's back that was it so what'd you say I said, like, hey, we need to pray. We need to I'll meet up with you. Like, I know they, you know, you and my brother are not together, but that doesn't mean I can't help somebody. And um, she never responded. Did this did this situation put a wall between them in a relationship wise? I mean, I know he was deployed overseas and stuff. Uh, yes, uh, very, very much so. Did he know they, this they, went on? They despise each other now. 
I got you. Did yeah. he did he know that this went on though with you guys? Like did did anybody tell him? We didn't while he was overseas because um he had had some some just some bad stuff happen um inside of his battalion and stuff and um he was pretty tore up about it and it really it really hurt him. Um so we we didn't want to add that that pressure on to him. You know what I mean? Yeah. Being over there and I'm I know me a dad myself and I know you're a dad like being away from your kids and then hearing something bad happen to your kids, you're like, I got to go right now. You know what I mean? And he couldn't. So we didn't want that. We don't want to bring that up, you know? Sure. Absolutely. Yeah, man, this just a very interesting story that you guys all went through and stuff. And, uh, you know, it's unfortunate that it seems like she's probably going through it again. Um, but you know, when they say that when you cast out, because I mean, this is all very spiritual and mm-hmm. it, it's and people don't want to, you know, believe that this is all spiritual, but it is. Sure, and, sure. And when you cast out a demon out of somebody, um, they say that you should right afterwards really pursue, you know, leading that person to salvation through Jesus mm-hmm. Christ. Because um, if you don't, that, demonic entity can come back with its friends you know like absolutely uh bring absolutely. more of its buddies with and uh you know i don't know what her situation is spiritually but uh unfortunately it sounds like it's back yeah yeah and that's uh, and we did we went through the salvation prayer with her uh, that was something i did not mention but uh, we did go through the salvation prayer with her afterwards um but you know you have to, you have to give, you know, people that free will, that free will is still there. You know what I mean? Like whether she truly accepted Christ or not is, is completely between her and God. And, um, you know, I don't, I, I, it was like, it was good for years. And then all of a sudden it was like back. So it was like, I don't know if it was, I don't know if she, by the way she meant like if it was possessed she felt like she was possessed again or it was maybe oppression you know if she did change her heart so maybe stuff was happening in the house i don't know like i said all i got was it's back um so you know that that it just bothered me for a long time because i was like i feel like i failed her but i know in my heart i didn't i did what i was supposed to do but um so i don't know it just gets me emotional. I don't, I, I don't mean to, it, it just bothers me a lot, man. Like, I mean, I can understand that it bothers you. Uh, it's something that's personal and, um, you know, just because they're divorced doesn't mean you stop caring for somebody when they're part of your family. And, sure. uh, you know, I can understand how it bothers you. It, clearly, as you were telling the story and stuff, you could tell that it was bothering you. Um, you know, it, it is what it is. I mean, unless she's going to, you know, create an avenue for you to help. Uh, all you can really do is, you know, leave it to God and, yeah. and pray for. Her. Yeah, man, totally, totally. Uh, I appreciate uh, you listening to me, my story, man, because it just it means a lot. And I tell people sometimes, and I, you know, I, I get that. I'm gonna do that, and you know, come on, man, and. You know, but luckily, since my brother-in-law was there, he got to experience it as well. And, um, you know, he's not, he's not, he, he doesn't like to tell the story because I think it was more traumatic for, for him. And, you know, just, he had never experienced anything like that. And, uh, he doesn't like to, to talk about it, but every time I bring it up, he's like, Oh, not this again, you know, but we, we do bring it up from time to time. And in fact, um, Thanksgiving, my family was like, tell that story. But my niece was there and I was like, I can't, I can't do that. I can't tell that tell story. That while story. She's Entertain us. Yeah. 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 So, but once again, man, thank you so much for listening to me. And, um, I like to get it out there cause uh, I, I feel like, if I can help other people or it's not like, I don't, I don't want any a pat on the back or anything. I, I just, I believe this stuff is super real and we experience it every day, whether we know it or not. And 
I, I want to I want people to know that you're not alone. There are people if you're dealing with something, do not lock it up. Like let somebody know so we can help so you can find somebody to help you. Because that's not living with something like when you when you have something you know oppressing you or possessing you, that's not a way to live. You're just existing because they have control of of everything. And um you know, it's just it's a it's a it just bothers me then to know that people out there that like are living with something like that um but you know we just gotta as believers we have to come alongside of them and and help them the best way we can yeah well man i appreciate you sharing the story and being transparent with people uh it's, yeah, man, thank you. it's not easy to do i understand i mean uh sometimes i i kind of I forget what it's like talking talking on a recording for the first time, you know. And mm-hmm. you know, for me, it's it's old hat. But you know, for somebody that I'm talking to, it's usually their first time. And so, um, you know, for you to be able to open up like that, you know, and share with the audience, I think is is great. And I appreciate it, man. Yeah, thank you so much. All right, Mark, thanks for coming on the show and sharing your stories. Very much appreciated. Before we get to Josh, I want to tell you guys about Philo. Philo is a new company that I came across recently, and they are pretty darn cool because if you're anything like me where... I actually go back and forth with canceling cable because I don't watch TV enough. My wife watches Netflix mostly. Really don't have a whole lot of justification for having cable other than wanting to watch sports on occasion. But even now with sports in 2020, it's kind of hard to watch because there's not a whole lot of sports out there right now. Everybody's getting canceled because everybody has COVID-19. And so it's hard to justify the bill of having the cable. But now Philo is a great option because Philo is live and on demand for just 20 dollars a month it's the best way to watch all your favorite tv shows and they even have tv shows from yesterday like the fresh prince friends and my favorite the office yes i absolutely love the office they do offer it and if you're on netflix if you haven't noticed or if you haven't heard about it netflix is dropping the office and soon it won't be available on netflix so maybe you can get the office on philo philo is a great option if you don't feel like paying a hefty fee every month for cable there's no contracts commitment free, hassle-free, and unparalleled customer service. Philo has an unlimited, unlimited DVR, saves all your favorite shows so you can watch on your own schedule. It is available on your phone, laptop, tablet, TV with the Roku, Fire TV, Apple TV, Android TV. It's available on all those devices. It couldn't be more convenient. And now more than ever, Philo believes that great TV shouldn't cost an arm and a leg, should be accessible to everyone, and saving money shouldn't mean giving up the shows and channels you love. Philo is TV for everyone. Sign up today at philo.tv slash Tony and you'll get up to 25% off your first two months. That's P-H-I-L-O dot TV slash T-O-N-Y. Philo.tv slash Tony and you'll get 25% off your first two months. Now let's get to Josh right now. All right, today we got Josh on the show. Josh, how you doing, man? Good, Tony, how you doing? I'm doing good, doing good. So uh, you're in Northeast Michigan and uh, you're a sheriff deputy. Uh, So Mm -hmm. I'm sure you have plenty of interesting interesting stories that you come across in your line of work that maybe isn't even paranormal, but you've just, you know, being that in that line of work, I'm sure you see it all. Uh, but Oh, you name it. I've seen it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I've talked to people that are in law enforcement and, and I, you know, I, I, when I was younger, I was um, in parking enforcement, which isn't, you know, the same thing you, but like I would go to the court to, you know, deal with the tickets and all that stuff. And you get to know the sheriffs, you get to know the police officers of the city and stuff like that. And the judges, and you get talking with them. And some of the stories are telling you, it's just like, Holy crap. You know, like I could tell stories from what, I did, but some of these guys, man, holy moly! So, did I just say holy moly? Oh, yeah, <laughs> that's <it's awful. laughs> oh my lord. Oh. Anyways, uh, so you're a sheriff's deputy, and uh, you were dispatched to a very unique situation. So, if you want, just go ahead and start us off with you know what happened and uh, what you find out and see. All right. Well, let's see. It would have been about three summers ago. 
I can't tell you the exact date, but I know it was Friday because there was three of us working. So anyway, uh, we get dispatched to a uh, a male who's calling saying his father-in-law wants to kill him and then wants to kill himself. So we go out. My partners get there. Both of them get there before I do. And I'm all the way across the county. So fly over there and I'm the third guy on, on scene. So I'm playing catch up the entire time. And so I've been there actually to this residence before. It's this little subdivision in the middle of the Huron National Forest. There is absolutely nothing out there. It's down a dirt road and you know, you hear banjos playing and you get out there. So anyway, you get out there and um talking to the the son in law who called and you know, I, I knew him by his first hand because dealing with him before and I'm like, Hey, what's going on? He's like, well, my father-in-law, he just got up here yesterday, says he hasn't slept in several days, and, you know, he's, he's acting really weird. I'm like, well, what do you mean by weird? And he's like, well, he, he says he wants to kill me, and then he wants to kill himself. I'm like, all right, do you say he's going to do it? He goes, yeah, he wants to stab me with this, this pair of scissors. Like, okay. Um, you know, like, what's his deal? Like, do you guys get into it or something? He goes, no, he just looked at me. And it was the weirdest look I've ever seen in my life. And he goes, I'm going to kill you, but I'm going to kill myself. And I said, like, that's when I called 911. I'm like, all right. So we were standing out on the porch. And like when he's talking to me, you know, you get a feel for, for talking with people and everything. And it was just weird. Like, it just seemed like a heavy atmosphere. And I was like, this is really weird. Like, the hair on the back of my neck was standing up. And I'm like, okay, well, let's just figure out, you know, what's going to happen from here. And my partners are talking to him. and. You know, I'm, I'm pretty much thinking, all right, this guy's going to go to the hospital. He's going to get checked out by a doctor. You know, if he's got to go to the mental institution for however many days they need to put him in there, <laughs> excuse me, um, then that's what's going to happen. So they're in there talking to him. And that guy, he's, I don't know, I'd probably say 65 or so. And he goes, you know, tells a story to my partners. And I'm listening to him. And I looked at him like, why do you want to hurt him? he looks at me with like the weirdest look like it was like he was looking at me but then there was like something else looking at me like behind his eyes i don't even know how to describe it It was the weirdest thing and it just like gave me just straight up chills and i was like oh this is this, this guy's weird and he goes the voices tell me to do it i'm like the voices he goes yeah the voices they're telling me to kill him and then kill myself i was like then what's going to happen from there he goes i don't know this is what they're telling me to do and so my partners look at me, I look at them, I'm like, holy smokes, we need to get something going with this guy. And so I'm, I don't know, you just, it kind of was at the time, just like a, a normal, I guess you could, if you consider it normal, a crazy person call and, uh, or excuse me, a mental, be politically correct. But, uh, so we had the ambulance come and they take them and something just told me, you know, like, you should pray for that guy. I'm like, okay. So I start praying for him and so to give you it takes about you know 10 miles or so just to get to the main road on dirt roads to get out of the subdivision so there's the ambulance my one partner is going to follow him up to the hospital another my other partner and then myself so i can't see in the back of the ambulance because it has those you know like the one-way stickers on it where you can see up and not in and so i'm like you know praying i'm like you know god just give this man you know his mind some rest and ease and you know if he actually does have voices or something like that you know quiet them and and let this man, you know, have some peace. So I'm praying for him, but it was like you could feel somebody staring at you. And I can look right at the ambulance as it's driving, and I feel like this guy is staring at me the entire time I'm behind him. And I'm like, this is absolutely like the weirdest call ever. Like I got hundreds of calls, you know, over my seven year career of, you know, dealing with such weird people. But like this one, I was just like, what in the world? Like it is just the weirdest feeling the entire time I'm there. It's like, it's hard to breathe when you're there. I'm like, man. So I ended up turning off because it's right at the end of shift. Of course, you know, all the weird stuff happens right at the end where you're going to stay forever, you know, <laughs> and you yeah. get stuck at work because, hey, surprise, there's that late call and you get hit with it. And uh, so they turn off and, and keep going. And I go back to the office. And as soon as I turn, I couldn't see the ambulance anymore. That That feeling of being stared at was just gone i was like that guy was staring at me there's something more here than just him being crazy like you just could feel it and i'm like man oh man so I, I kept praying for this guy and everything like that and so at the time i had weekends off 
So this is Friday. So awesome. I get to go home. So Sunday I'm, I'm laying in bed and my wife's next to me. She's, you know, on Facebook and doing her normal thing. And it's like, someone is like standing on me or like straddling me and like sleep paralysis. I've never, ever had it in my life. And I like, I just started panicking. I'm like, Oh man. Like after like all these stories I've heard and people, you know, it's the most terrifying thing. Oh, it most definitely is. You know, it's like my fear is like not being in control of the situation. As soon as it goes downhill, you're like, Oh man. But like, it was weird because like people say they can like open their eyes and look around. I could, it was like, I tried to, but it was just black. And it was like, somebody was like right in your face, but yelling at you, but they weren't yelling. It was like static, like on a TV or radio station or something like that. And it was like, just in my face. And I'm like, Oh man, I definitely opened a can of worms here. Well, you know, praying for that guy. There's something definitely more than, you know, what everyone else thought. So I'm just like, dear Lord, I need some help here. You know, this is a, something more than I can handle. You know, command you to stop. And as soon as I said that, like, I felt like somebody got off of me. I get open my eyes and I was facing the wall. So I roll over and look at my wife and she's still on Facebook. I'm like, she didn't feel that. She didn't see that like nothing. I'm like the lights on and everything. Like I'm just falling asleep. It's not like I was, you know, in a deep sleep or nothing. Like people say they wake up at, you know, three o'clock in the morning and they're like, Oh, you know, it happened. No, I mean, my wife was up. The kids were still goofing around downstairs. I'm like, Oh man, this is serious. And then I had it happen a couple more times throughout. I think it was once more that week. And then it was like months. And then it happened a third time. It's only three times I've ever had it. And it was just, I'm second and third time. I was like, really? It's all you got to do the same thing again. Okay. Well, it is what it is. And we'll, you know, pray the big man and, uh, and go from there. And, you know, every single time I start praying and, you know, it's just like, I, I went to a parochial school from kindergarten to seventh grade. And so you don't really just been real big in my life and, and my family's religious and everything like that. So it's, you know, it's not something out of ordinary to sit down and pray. You know, you got an issue or anything like that. But man, oh man, it's just like you have to and you gotta stay on top of it. And and since then it's like I don't know, that summer I just I was working a lot too, so it's probably part of it. You know, working midnight shift, have a family and trying to juggle eight thousand things as you know, we were talking about earlier, trying to just juggle life. And it just seemed like I was always so mad about stuff. Like it just was like a switch since dealing with it, that guy, like now it's, it's better. I don't know if it's just, you know, continuing praying or anything like everything like that. But, you know, I just had a, a feeling that I was just being oppressed for a long time because whatever was afflicting this guy, I think was mad because I started praying for him and I kept praying for that, that guy. And so then it wanted to make sure that, you know, I, I knew what I was messing with. And then once you know, then you start looking back and you're like, holy smokes, you know, that back and whatever, um, you know, when you're like younger, you're like, well, that was, that was definitely something different with that. <laughs> and like, even listening to your show and other shows and stuff like that, it's like you, you go, man, I've definitely had more experiences. Once you realize what you're looking for, you can't stop looking at it. Yeah. You can't stop seeing it. And it's like, and all of a sudden, you know, that side that knows, he, you know, he knows. So then it just like, it's just weird things like that. And so I was talking to my mom and dad about it one day out of the porch at their house. And my mom overheard me, like she was inside and my dad were outside with this BS. And she goes, yeah, I had something like that happen to me right around that time. Like, what are you talking about? So the first time I had the sleep paralysis, she had like that night or the next night, the same thing, like almost verbatim. I'm like, okay, that is not a coincidence whatsoever. Things happen for a reason, and and something's really mad. So they're not only attacking me, they're attacking not my family. And I'm like, mm, this isn't going to work. You know, so I talked to my dad. I mean, he's real big on, you know, make sure, you know, before you go to bed or anything like that, make sure you pray, you know, talk about your day with God and, you know, ask for God and stuff like that. And he goes, you need to step your prayer game up. But I'm like, it definitely sounds like it. You know, so you just keep praying and praying and it's just, holy smokes. <laughs> but um, it just seemed like once 
I had that problem with with this guy and whatever it was he had oppressing him, obsessing him, whatever, it just like little things at the house. Um this is one night when I was off and go away, buddy. Um sorry, my <laughs> son just walked in the room. That's right. <laughs> um that's it. I'm on the phone. Line. Um, so anyway, he, uh, we're laying in bed and I guess I just kept waking up and I only remember the fourth time waking up and I remember looking at the wall and my wife has these, uh, Christmas villages and they were on. And so they cast a shadow and, uh, it was like somebody standing in the doorway and I shot up out of bed and I'm, you know, I'm mad because I'm like, I thought someone was in the house. I'm like, Oh, it's go time. And my wife's like, are you for real? This is the fourth time you've woken up. And you keep saying, oh, there's somebody there. There's somebody there. I'm like, there, I swear to God, I saw somebody. There was a shadow. And it, it was a man standing in the doorway. Like, no, no, it wasn't. There's nobody there. I'm like, okay. And I, I think part of that is, you know, like, with, with the demonic thing is that they want it to mess with your mind. And so they play games with you like that. And they continue to play games with you to make you sit there and question everything. Well, what about this? What about that? And then I think that's the first part of, of trying to erode your mind. You know how they always say is, you know, you keep a strong mind, you know, nothing's going to bother you. You know, you can ride it out, you know, let, you know, people, um, you know, make fun of you, let's say, and you just let it slide off your back and you don't let it worry about you because, you know, you're a better person than them and that uh, you, uh, you know, you can do better than them by just not letting it bother you, you know, with bullies and stuff, you know, same concept. Don't let them, don't let it get to you. And then they'll stop bugging you. Well, <laughs> she was, my wife was just mad as all get out. I kept waking her up. And so then time goes by and once again, I'm trying to fall asleep and I can hear all the boys down the base are playing and I can hear each other voices and them running around and my wife's in bed and, I'm just about asleep and I hear somebody and it sounds, this is a weird part. It sounds exactly like me with my work boots on walking around the table is a hardwood floor downstairs, walking on the table and then walking up the stairs. And then I'm expect, and then I like, I kind of roll over and I expect to see somebody. And I'm like, who is that? And then there's nothing. I go up there, look, don't see nothing. I go downstairs. All the boys are just down there. I'm like, okay. And I'm like, I heard it plain as day. I'm talking to my wife. I'm like, you hear that? She's like, no, I didn't hear anything. What are you talking about? I'm like, uh, somebody just walked across the floor. You sure it wasn't one of the boys? I was like, no, it sounded exactly like me. That's the weird part. And I don't know. It's just, you know, like, like I said, once you notice it, it's like now it's just, you keep noticing it. You notice it. But then at the same time, you don't want to sit there and go, oh, yep, most definitely. That's something weird. Yeah. No, you know, nine out of 10, you can, you can explain. There's a rational explanation. You know, it's just what my job, you know, it revolves around on facts. But once you get past all that, then you're like, okay, I've exhausted every other option. There's there's definitely something else here. You know, it's, you know, truth is stranger than fiction. You know, it's like sometimes, you know, just dealing with people with on a normal complaint, they'll tell you a story. And you're like, that's pretty bizarre. I think you're BSing me here. You know, you can tell by their body language, just how they're talking to you. But then there's other people who tell you just a goofy off the wall story. And you're like, what? So when you start following up and sure, you know, <laughs> they're, they're true. 100%. And it's like, you know what? Sometimes the stranger calls are almost the ones that have more truth to them than somebody just calling to, you know, complain about their neighbor's dog. And nine out of 10, the dog isn't barking and they just don't like them. And it's just an excuse to have you come over there and harass them essentially. But it's, <sighs> it's just like since then, it's just, it's little things like that. Um, I had dealt with a lady actually right probably been a year ago, almost actually a little bit more than a year ago, the beginning of January. And this lady calls and says, somebody's in her house. Of course, I have been a ship once again. And I was just about to get off of work at two o'clock in the morning. So of course I'm there and I fly out there and this lady opens the door and it takes her God almost a minute to unlock all the locks she has on the door. You'd hear them all unlocking. I'm like, we're in the middle of nowhere. I mean, I'm not saying you know, crime is a zero, but most people don't lock their doors around here. 
And so this lady's unlocking all the doors. She opens the door, and this lady's 92, I think, at the time. And, I mean, she is just scared to death. So I'm like, okay. I'm like, you know, you called and said that there was somebody in your house. You know, is it okay if I come inside and look around? She goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I'm like, all right, well, let's go walk in and, you know, we'll talk and I'll go look through your house. And, you know, uh, we had a, a, a complaint there once before of her saying somebody was in her house. So I'm not trying to dismiss it, but at the same time, I'm like, well, nah, this lady's older and you never know. She might, you know, start be losing her mind, you know, dementia, Alzheimer's, whatever. But, uh, so I go and I, uh, start looking through the house. As I'm looking through the house, every single door and window has like five or six cowbells, like on a string tied to everything. And I'm like, man, this lady is paranoid. It's all get out. And so I'm walking around and, and I had asked her, I was like, what's the guy look like? And she looks at me, just dead serious. He looks like you. I'm like, okay. Well. What? I'm like, yeah. She said, she, he looks like you. And I'm like, what do you mean? He looks like me. Well, he's about your height. And I'm bald. He's bald, and you know he's got he's got just you know pants and a, and a shirt on. I'm like, okay, like anything distinctive, like a scar, a tattoo, like I don't know, an earring, something like that. She goes, nope, he just looks like you. And I'm like, all right, this lady is out there in left field. So I'll I'll do my my sweet make her feel good and go home. So I'm walking around, and and this is actually the funny part of kind of a serious story and so I walk in this room and the door opens up to the left and there's a and it's all dark so I got my flashlight and my gun out you know make it look good and she uh she goes he's in that room I'm like what but like, yeah that's the room he went in when I called and I'm like great you know this lady she's like right on top of me the whole time like she is just scared to death I'm like oh man so I walk in this room see the bed everything okay and I turn and the whole scared the living daylights out of me. I jumped about a foot in the air. There's a mirror, like the glass uh, sliding doors for like a closet, and it's all mirror. And I see out of the corner of my eye somebody that looks like me, well, it's me. And she said, the guy looks like me, so I jump and scream like a little girl. <laughs> she goes, and she's like, she just doesn't figure it out. Like, she's just, you know, so serious at the time, and I'm trying not to laugh at this point because I about shot myself in the mirror, you know? So I keep walking through the house, nothing. So I'm like, all right, well, I'll get you all your info. And I'm like, do you have any, any family members or anything like that I can call? She's like, yeah, you can call my son, blah, blah, blah. Here's his number. I'm like, all right, I'm going to give him a call and have him give you a call here in a little bit. And uh, you can talk to him and we'll go from there. And she's like, no, you can't leave. I'm like, what do you mean? As soon as you leave, he'll come back. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, what you, I'm like, not trying to be like rude or anything. I'm like, man, there's nobody in this house. You have every door locked up. Every window is locked up. You got a security system. You said it works. Set it, set the alarm and, and try and get some sleep. So I called the son and, and I get back to the office and she's like, yeah, she's got the beginning stages of all, or uh, dementia. I'm like, all right, well, that makes sense. You know, paranoia and things like that. So I don't think much of it till, oh man, let's see, this is February or then December. I want to say it was right before Christmas. So we get an alarm call, and I hear the hear the um, address come out, and I kind of think about it, and I'm like, that really sounds familiar. And I pull up, and I'm like, oh, my God, this is the house, that old lady who said there's people in the house. So it was um, the alarm call was for bedroom motion. And so I start walking around the house and everything. And, you know, it's all locked up. There's six inches of snow on the ground. I look around, and. There's not that my partner, he pulls up and we're talking. I'm like, hey, I have a really weird call this lady saying there's people in her house walking around. And I remember seeing a, a sensor in that bedroom. And she said that that guy walked in that room. And I'm like, that's really weird that that, that sensor went off. Not saying that it's, you know, paranormal or anything, but the fact is that just that one happened to go off. You know, it happens all the time. So I go back in our, our logs and that sensor had went off once before. A week previous, same thing. Nobody is there. Call a family. Yeah, no one's been there in, in months. I'm like, you know, you guys have an alarm go off? You know, you guys have to get a fix or something. They're like, yeah, they've come out and looked. They said the sensor's working properly. 
but it seems to keep going off. And it's, it's for motion only. I'm like, do you have the heat on or anything? Look, no, we don't have anything turned on. It's, the house has been winterized. It's shut down. And we don't plan going back till spring. And I'm like, well, something's going off still. So I don't know what to tell you. But it's just kind of one of those weird things. It's like, was this lady actually crazy? Or was she actually seeing somebody? And, and she said that the guy just would yell at her. He wouldn't say anything. He would just yell. And then it made me think about when I had my sleep paralysis and whatever that was, was just yelling at me. He didn't say words and say, stay away, you know, nothing like that. It was just yelling. I'm like, that is odd. Yeah, it, it's definitely odd. And, you know, it, it makes you wonder sometimes with these people who, you know, are labeled crazy that they were seeing this, that, and the other, if they're really, you know, if they're really all that crazy or if they truly were seeing things. I mean, uh, mm-hmm. there's, I rarely, rarely, rarely watch TV, Netflix. Like I have Netflix, my wife watches it, but I don't have a ton of time. And so Mm -hmm. yesterday I had a friend text me and he said that there's a movie on Netflix called, I think it was called Horse Girl or something like that. And he's he's like, it looks really interesting. It looks like it's about abduction. So um, yesterday afternoon, I actually had a a free couple hours and I was like, let me just sit here and and watch this and kind of decompress a little bit because I've been really running around busy. And um, I watched this show and it lays out this story of a woman who uh, is being abducted in her mind and they present her in a way where like to the like to you, the viewer and the world around, um, she looks like a crazy person, but you also are uh-huh. seeing what she's going through. And so you're left as a viewer wondering, well, am I viewing what she's imagining or is she really going through this and it's driving her crazy? Like, you're not totally sure mm-hmm. until the very end of the movie what's going on. And I don't want to spoil it for anybody, but, um, you know, it, it's that idea that, you know, maybe some of these people who are quote unquote crazy, maybe they're not that crazy. Maybe they're actually experiencing some really crazy stuff that's making them almost seem definitely. crazy. Mm-hmm. And, and that's where I, I kind of thought about, like what I said earlier, is, uh, you know, the first process of like, is eroding your mind as soon as your mind's gone your body just does whatever and uh you know i've been to a lot of classes for like mental illness and things like that and you know they're like oh people are hearing voice and someone goes oh they're possessed i was like you don't know like you really don't nine out of ten are they no but there's gonna be that one time and you're not gonna know what's wrong with this person and it's just it's just crazy because people just want to like dismiss it so much. And I was like, well, there's nothing else you can really think of. It could be this. It most definitely could. I mean, are there people, you know, legit mental illnesses? Oh yeah. Like paranoid schizophrenic. Those are always fun. Yeah. They're, they're diagnosed. They got, they got a problem, a biological issue and it is what it is. And there's nothing you can do except, you know, medication and treatment and try and stay on top of it. But then other people, it's like, you know, they're slowly going down that slope because, uh, like let's say something's you know messing with their mind uh you know um spiritually and they uh just start losing it because it just it's nagging at them all the time it, and it's tiresome because i know when i was at, like i just felt mad all the time so i was like what is the deal and i was thinking about that guy and i was like i gotta really start praying some more and it's just like little things would tick me off and so then you're always mad and the kids are like oh man dad's are gonna be in a bad mood today and then I felt like, man, you know, my family's going to suffer because of it too, because because of my attitude. And it's not that I'm trying to be mad. It's just that I think that that's part of it is trying to disconnect you from your lifeline, your family, you know, your foundation. And then once that happens, you know, all gloves are off, and you know, you <laughs> you better figure it out, or you know, you're going to start losing it, and you know, the bad guys are going to get one point on the board. But yeah, it seems like it seems like what happened to you was exactly what you described. I mean, you interfered with something that was on a spiritual level and therefore it put you put a red bullseye on your back. Um, you mm-hmm. know, it's like it's like you you entered into a whole new realm 
And I mean that like literally like on a spiritual plateau, mm -hmm. you enter into a whole new realm and everybody, everything in that realm, when you walked in through that door, turned and looked at you and they're like, oh, how you doing? You know, <laughs> and, exactly. And you had no idea what, exactly. what, you, what you were getting into, but they knew who you mm -hmm. are. They, that you're like, that was basically you saying, guys, I'm over here. <laughs> and, and it was exactly. Like, hey, surprise. Yeah. And, and I'm not even saying that's, that you did anything wrong because I don't think you did anything wrong. As, as far as I'm concerned with how I view life and stuff, I don't think you did anything wrong. Um, I, I just think mm -hmm. it's the reality of the situation, you know, uh, what you described is classic spiritual warfare and, um, mm -hmm. you know, people go through that stuff and, uh, you know, the repercussion, there are repercussions that come from that, especially if you don't know what you're dealing with and you get involved in something that maybe you're not prepared for. Uh, I, I've been in those boats myself and it's, it's just oh, not mm -hmm. fun. Not fun. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. and, at, and at the time it was funny. I was, um, You've probably heard of uh, Russ Dizdar. He he does a lot oh, yeah. of uh, a lot of uh, podcasts, stuff like that. You know, the online you know ministry and things like that. And I was listening to his uh, Black Awakening series, and that, that's all it is talking about a spiritual warfare. And at the time, I was pretty close to the end of the series, and I was listening to it. And then you know this this guy pops up, and I'm like, oh man, holy smokes! Like this is legit. Like I didn't think, you know, it wasn't. You know, because religion from day one has been part of my life. But the fact is that now you're seeing it firsthand. It's always, you know, you can stand back and Monday night quarterback it all the time and go, oh, yeah, 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 this is what I do. But then you're there and you're like, oh, what do I do? And so you're like, when in doubt, just start praying. And it's going to get you out of it, you know. And, uh, you know, the good Lord and the Holy Spirit will definitely move you and you'll say what you need to say and, and move on from there. And, you know, he'll protect you. I mean, he's not going to just let you sit there and flounder and go, well, figure it out. You got yourself into the mess. You know, you get to figure it out, buddy. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I mean, it's it, it's what you just said. You made it sound so simple. And, and in a sense, it is. But at the same time, it's it's not. And I understand the compl the complexities of it. And, uh, you know, it's life. And uh, we find our way through it. And, you know... The, I think the sooner people realize that there's more to this life than what we physically can see and touch, uh, the sooner they're able to prepare themselves for what's really going on. Uh, so before we get uh -huh. out of here, though, Josh, I want to, uh, and I don't even know if there's an answer to this, but I want to ask you, because of your profession, outside of paranormal type experiences, what's something crazy that you went through? with your job? I mean, I'm sure you have things pop up here and there, but is there something that stands wow. out in your mind that you're just like, yeah, that was a crazy day. Oh man. You asked me right on the spot. <laughs> oh. It's, it's, I don't know. It's just, man, oh man. I don't have to really think about it. I'm going to burn up your ear time here. Um, man, just something crazy. I mean, we've had some, I guess you can just think of this like, just people saying that, you know, oh, <laughs> this one guy, he's a well-known person in our, uh, in our uh, community. So he calls in and says that he's seeing lights over his house. And I'm like, what do you mean? What? So, of course, state police, they go out there. And I go out there. I didn't even make it out there because I was just getting on. Essentially, he was claiming he was seeing UFOs over his house. And I'm like, what? He goes, yeah, yeah, there's UFOs over the house. There's UFOs over the house. And we go, what, you mean those lights over there? Goes, yeah, those are UFOs. I'm like, no, dude, that, that's a TV tower. That's what that is. <laughs> and you have cell phone and stuff like that on there. Like this guy, he's, he's one of those guys who, you know, essentially walks around with a tinfoil hat, has all his books. You know, his, uh, he goes to all the, like, the town hall meetings, things like that, with his, his Bibles is what he calls them you know, his articles of confederation and yeah. ridiculous things like that. And he's like, yeah, they're UFOs. I've seen them. I'm like, it's a, I'm like, it's a TV tower. And the troopers are telling me about it. And I'm like, Oh my God. And he calls in crazy stuff like that all the time. And it's not the first time he's called again. <laughs> it's like, what? And so, you know, him being this well-known member of society, I'm like, how do the how do people respect him so much when all he does is like walk around with his tinfoil hat on and, you know, and, and just, he's just like a crazy, 
a crazy guy who lives out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, if I can think of something else that's crazier, I'll definitely email you and, <laughs> and uh, let you know. But no, I, it's just like the fact is like he, he's trying so hard to like come up with something. And he's like, uh, yeah, I'm going to call in about these UFOs that are in the sky. I'm not saying it couldn't be, but dude, it's a TV tower. Lights are blinking. It's nothing, nothing crazy for you, bud. Yeah. Go home, go to sleep. <laughs> Don't call. Yeah, it, it's it's funny. I mean, people, I think, sometimes are so desperate to have an experience when it comes to paranormal type ex- stuff, like whether it's UFOs, aliens, ghosts, demons, whatever. And uh, I sometimes mm-hmm. think that they make it up, you know, in their head, not intentionally, but in their head, they just... They, they 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 can't help it they they just start seeing it everywhere and that's what i i see a lot with the uh the bigfoot idea of things like you know i'm online i see a lot of pictures and all that stuff and people email me and uh yeah, i'm sure i'm going to get n- angry emails for saying this but you know people are so desperate to see bigfoot sometimes that they wear their you know gopros in the woods on their hikes and they review the footage and they start seeing it everywhere and look, it was following me here, there, and you're looking at it, and you're like, you're like, I, I see a tree, uh, I see a shadow. Yeah. It, it, Some leaves move. Yeah, it's like, well, got to be big for it, right? And so, you know, and even just the the other stuff, like uh, sometimes you'll see a bear pop up that's just in a weird position on a game cam. And they're like, look, it's Bigfoot. I'm like, no, it's a bear. Like, the, <laughs> like the, there was one that was, that was circulating around. I think it was in Pennsylvania. I'm not. I think it was Pennsylvania where it was a bear leaning over into a trough eating food. And they're like, that's clearly a ba- a, a Bigfoot. And I'm like, no, it's not. And I, I I sent the picture to many like professional wildlife people, and they all confirmed it was a bear. I, I I'm looking at it. It looks like a bear. And then people were saying, look, there's a Bigfoot in the background too, looking. And I'm like, it's a tree. It's literally a tree. <laughs> I'm just like, man. But you know, I understand. I mean, I go ahead. Oh, we had this guy who uh, I was talking with a conservation officer here, and he goes, you won't believe it. So he sends me a picture where I'm talking on the phone. He goes, look at this. He goes, what does it look like? Mine looks like a house cat on a game camp. He goes, yeah, that's what it is. The guy's claiming it's a cougar. I'm like, <laughs> unless that grass is 20 feet high, that is a house cat. There is no way that's a cougar. We've had a very rare sighting of a cougar, like 60, 70 some years ago, but we don't have them down here. They're all in the UP. In the Upper Peninsula. I mean, it's not something we have around here. Could it be? It, it could, but I, it, I just don't see it. No, it's a house cat, buddy. It's a tabby cat. Like, go. You know, if you want to hold on to that and tell everyone it's a cougar, by all means, go for it. But <laughs> we're not going to believe it. It's like, you're like, you know, he's trying so hard. Like, it's a cougar. It's a cougar. <laughs> like, you know, you want to believe it yourself. By all means, go for it. it I don't care. <laughs> but it's not the facts. It's not true. It's it's a house cat. Yeah, there, there's we do have cougars here in Pennsylvania, and Pennsylvania says that we don't, but I've seen the pictures of them. Like they're straight up cougars, and yeah, they're they're good, you know, hundred pounds to hundred twenty five pound cats. And uh, I even have a guy that I work with that um, saw one get hit by a, a vehicle, and it's whoever it was, I don't know who comes and deals with that stuff, but the road wound up getting blocked off. They cleaned up the, the the cat and they're like, no, no cat here. And I'm just like, why, yeah. why do you care so much about protecting the idea that Pennsylvania is mountain lion free? I don't understand it. Like it, like we have, they don't pictures. want to scare people. I don't know. We have bobcats and they admit that. And it's like, if there's mountain lion in Pennsylvania, who cares? Just you know, be honest about it. Like it's better for us mm-hmm. to know when we go into the woods what we're what to expect because those bad boys they oh, creep, exactly. they'll crawl up on you and they'll they'll get you before you even know they're there. Yeah, and once you know, it's too late, and they're gonna get you. You know, what in Cal- was it California that guy fought with one? He was hiking, yes. I think, back him while he was running or something like that. I'm like, forget he that. killed it with his bare hands. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm like, well, geez, oh, peeps. I wonder yeah. if you know. I always. You know, carry whenever I go anywhere just because the fact of people don't like me because of my profession and you know people say they're going to come kill me all the time so it's whatever but it's this fact is you know he's a peace you know this thing comes up on you and the guy has to fight it off with his bare hands and he's out just running in the woods for whatever reason you know because he likes to but now I to, <sighs> that. 
not not to say that this guy isn't badass because he is. I mean, seriously, like, <laughs> oh, most like, definitely. like for Probably. sure, for sure. But I, I do want to say that uh, from the from what I've gathered on that story. This was probably like an adolescent mountain lion. It wasn't a full grown mm-hmm. one. Uh, but yeah. either way, like killing something with your bare hands that's trying to kill you and it's tr- it's natural, like its instinct is to murder. Like that's mm-hmm. that's tough. Like like 100%. Mm-hmm. I want you in my corner, <laughs> you know. So, yep. <laughs> but uh, you're mine, bud. You're yeah. mine. <laughs> like if we're picking teams, you're on my team. So, uh, <laughs> Josh, man, I appreciate you coming on and talking and chopping it up with me, man. It's been a real good time. Oh, my pleasure, Tony. I appreciate it. And, you know, thanks for giving everyone a platform that they can go and talk on, and you know, they're not going to be judged or told that they're they're a liar. So. <laughs> Well, that's the show, everybody. I really hope you enjoyed it. And if you did enjoy it, please share the show with your friends. That's the best thing you can do to help the show grow is just share the show with your friends. I don't care where you share it, who you talk to. If they got a smartphone, if they got a computer, we want them listening to The Confessionals and you could do your part by just sharing the show. And until next week, friends, stay safe, take care. And remember, the truth will set you free. But first, it'll piss you off. Bye. Hey, thanks for watching The Confessionals on YouTube. If you like what you heard, hit the subscribe button, hit the share button, and hit the like button. That would be a great help to me. And if you want more of The Confessionals on a weekly basis, every Thursday I come out with a special show just for members on my website. So if you want to check that out, go to theconfessionalspodcast.com, hit the join button, and become a member today. And every Thursday, you'll get a new show, and you can binge on previous shows, which there's almost a 100 of them. So if you love the show, go ahead and check it out. But thank you very much for being here on YouTube and checking out the channel.